LiDAR is, is a fool's errand. And, any, and anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. Expensive sensors that are, are unnecessary. It's like having a whole bunch of expensive appendices. Like one appendix is bad, well, now they want to put a whole bunch of them. That's ridiculous. So in the next section of my talk, I'm going to especially talk about depth perception using vision only. So you might be familiar that there are uh, at least two sensors uh, in a car. One is vision, cameras, just getting pixels, and the other is LiDAR that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, companies also use. And LiDAR gives you these point measurements of distance around you. Um, now, one, one thing I'd like to point out, first of all, is you all came here, you drove here, many of you, and you used your, <laughs> your uh, neural net and vision. You were not shooting lasers out of your eyes, and you still ended up here. <laughs> we might have. <laughs> so I mean, things went know, well. That's good for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, the human neural net uh, derives distance and all the measurements and the 3D understanding of the world just from vision. It actually uses multiple cues to do so. I'll just briefly go over some of them, just to give you a sense of roughly what's going on in, inside. Um, as an example, we have two eyes pointed out, so you get two independent measurements at every single time step of the world ahead of you, and uh, your brain stitches this information together to arrive at some depth estimation because you can triangulate any points uh, across those two uh, viewpoints. A lot of animals, instead, have eyes that are positioned on the sides, so they have very little overlap in their visual fields, so they will typically use structure for motion, and the idea is that they bob their heads and because of the movement, they actually get multiple observations of the world, and you can triangulate, again, depths. And even with one eye closed and completely motionless, you can still have some sense of depth perception. If you did this, I don't think you would notice me coming two meters towards you or 100 <laughs> meters back, and that's because there are a lot of very strong monocular cues that your brain also takes into account. This is an example of a pretty common visual illusion where you have, you know, these two blue bars are identical, but your brain, the way it stitches up this scene, is it just expects one of them to be larger than the other because of the vanishing lines of this image. So your brain does a lot of this uh, automatically. And, uh, and neural nets, artificial neural nets can as well. So let me give you three examples of how you can arrive at depth perception from vision alone. Um, a classical approach and two that rely on neural networks. So here's a video going down I think this is San Francisco, of a Tesla. So this, these are our cameras, our sensing, and we're looking at all, I'm only showing the main camera, but all the cameras are turned on, the eight cameras of the autopilot. And if you just have this six second clip, what you can do is you can stitch up this environment in 3D using multi-view stereo techniques. So this is the 3D reconstruction of those six seconds of that car driving through that path. And you can see that this information is purely, is, is very well recoverable uh, from just videos and roughly that's through process of triangulation and, as I mentioned, multi-view stereo. And we've applied similar techniques, on slightly more sparse and approximate also in the car. So it's remarkable, all that information is, is really there in the sensor and just a matter of extracting it. Um, the other project that I want to briefly talk about is, as I mentioned, there's nothing about neural network. Neural networks are very powerful visual recognition engines. And if you want them to predict depth, then you need to, for example, look for labels of depth, and then they can actually do that extremely well. So there's nothing limiting networks from predicting this monocular depth except for labeled data. So one example project that we've actually um, looked at internally is we use the forward-facing radar, which is shown in blue, and that radar is looking out and measuring depths of objects, and we use that radar to annotate the, uh, what vision is seeing, the bounding boxes that come out of the neural networks. So instead of human annotators telling you, okay, this, this car in this bounding box is roughly 25 meters away, you can annotate that data much better using sensors. So you use sensor annotation. So as an example, radar is quite good at that distance. You can annotate that, and then you can train a neural network on it. And if you just have enough data of it, this neural network is very good at predicting those patterns. So here's an example of predictions um, of that. So in circles, I'm showing radar objects, and, in, uh, and the cuboids that are coming out uh, here are purely from vision. So the cuboids here are just coming out of vision, and the depth of those cuboids is learned by a sensor annotation from the radar. So if this is working very well, then you would see that the circles in the top-down view would agree with the cuboids, and they do. And that's because neural networks are very competent at predicting depths. Uh, they can learn the different sizes of vehicles internally, and they know how big those vehicles are, and you can actually derive depth from that quite accurately. The last mechanism I will talk about very briefly is uh, slightly more fancy and gets a bit more technical, but it is a mechanism uh, that has recently um, 
there's a few papers basically over the last year or two on this approach, it's called self-supervision. So what you do in a lot of these papers is you only feed raw videos into neural networks with no labels whatsoever, and you can still learn, you can still get neural networks to learn depth. And it's a, bit, a little bit technical, so I can't go into the full details, but the idea is that the neural network predicts depth at every single frame of that video, and then there are no explicit targets that the neural network is supposed to regress to with the labels, but instead, the objective for the network is to be consistent over time. So whatever depth you predict should be consistent over the duration of that video, and the only way to be consistent is to be right. And so the neural network automatically predicts the correct depths for all the pixels, and we've reproduced some of these results internally, so this also works quite well. So in summary, people drive with vision only. No, no lasers are involved. This seems to work quite well. The point that I'd like to make is that visual recognition, and very powerful visual recognition, is, is absolutely necessary for autonomy. It's not a nice to have. Like we must have neural networks that actually really understand the environment around you. And, uh, and LIDAR points are a much less information rich uh, environment. So vision really understands the full details. Just a few points around are, are much, um, there's much less information in those. So as an example on the left here, um, is that a plastic bag or is that a tire? A, a LIDAR might just give you a few points on that, but vision can tell you which one of those two is true, and that impacts your control. Is that person who is slightly looking backwards, are they trying to merge in, into your lane uh, on the bike, or are, they just, uh, or are they just going forward? In the construction sites, what do those signs say? How should I behave in this world? The entire uh, infrastructure that we have built up for roads is all uh, designed for human visual consumption. So all the signs, all the traffic lights, everything is designed for vision. And so that's where all that information is, and so you need that ability. Is that person distracted and on their phone? Are they going to walk, walk into your lane? Those answers to all these questions are only found in vision and are necessary for level four, level five autonomy. And so in this sense, LIDAR is really a shortcut. It sidesteps the fundamental problems, the, the important problem of visual recognition that is necessary for autonomy. And so it gives a false sense of progress and is ultimately, it's ultimately a crutch. I should point out that uh, I don't actually super hate LIDAR as much as it may sound, um, but at, at SpaceX, uh, SpaceX Dragon uses LiDAR to navigate to the space station and dock. Not only that, we de SpaceX developed its own LiDAR from scratch to do that, and I spearheaded that effort personally, because in that scenario, LiDAR makes sense. And in cars, it's friggin' stupid. It's expensive and unnecessary, and as Andre was saying, once you solve vision, it, it's, it's worthless. So you have expensive hardware that's worthless on the car. The, we do have a forward radar, which, which is low cost and is helpful, especially for occlusion situations. So if there's like fog or dust or, or you know, snow, the radar can see through that. If you're going to use active photon generation, don't use visible wavelength, because once you, with, with passive optical, you've taken care of all visible wavelength stuff. You want, if you, 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 you want to use a wavelength that is occlusion penetrating like radar. So, so LiDAR is just active photon generation in the visual spectrum. If you're gonna do active photon generation, do it outside the visual spectrum in the radar, in, in the radar spectrum. So like at 3.8 millimeters versus 400 to 700 nanometers, you're gonna be have much better occlusion penetration, um, and that's why we have a forward radar. Um, and then we also have uh, ultra, 12 ultrasonics for, for near field information um, in addition to the eight cameras and, and, and the, the forward radar. Um, you only need the radar in the forward direction because that's the only direction you're going real fast. So, so I mean, we've gone over this multiple times, like, are we sure we have the right sensor suite? Should we add anything more? No. I just wanted to follow up partially on that uh, because several of your competitors in the space over the past few years have made, um, you know, have, have talked about how they are um, augmenting all of their perception and path planning capabilities that are kind of on the pl car platform with high definition maps of the areas that they are driving. Does that play a role in your system? Do you see it adding any value? Are there areas where you would like to get more data that is not collected from the fleet but is more kind of mapping style data? The high, high, high precision GPS um, maps um, and, and lanes are a really bad idea. Um, the, the system becomes extremely brittle so a any change, like this, this might, any change to the system makes it, it can't adapt. So if, 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 it, if it, it locks onto GPS and high precision lane lines um, and, and 
does not allow a vision override. In fact, vision should be the thing that, that does everything, ex and, and then, like, lane lines are a guideline, but, but they're, they're not the, the main, main thing. Uh, we, we briefly balked up the tree of high precision lane lines um, and then realized that was a huge mistake and, and reversed it out. It's not good. <laughs>